annoying to all and deadly to some, mosquitoes transmit diseases and viruses, including West Nile and the Zika. Scientists have developed genetically modified mosquitoes that could wipe out these deadly pests once and for all. But the question is, should they? Joining us now to consider the cost, wisdom, and feasibility of that in Guildford, UK, via Skype, Luke Alfie. He is professor of anthropogenetics at the Purbright Institute and visiting professor of genetics at the University of Oxford. And in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Catherine Rochon, professor of entomology at the University of Manitoba. And we're delighted that both of you could appear on TVO with us tonight. We want to start by just reading out this fun fact, let's call it. There are more than 3,500 species of mosquitoes. A mosquito can drink up to three times its weight in blood. Only female mosquitoes bite people. Female mosquitoes can lay up to 300 eggs at a time. Mosquitoes are considered the deadliest animal in the world. And Luke, I'd like to start with you and follow up on that last point. How deadly is deadly? Oh, well, mosquitoes between them kill more than half a million people a year, mostly from malaria. So, and in terms of infections, maybe uh, hundreds of millions, 300, 400 million infections with malaria, same again with dengue. And then there's a host of other diseases, Zika that you mentioned, you know, yellow fever going back a little further in, in, in time was a huge, huge problem and still is. Uh, so yes, they're collectively the most deadly animal in the world, uh, with the possible exception of humans, of course. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> yes. Now, I don't hear about mosquitoes killing people in Canada too often, so I'm assuming we're in the clear. But where does this mostly happen? Uh, mostly in tropical countries. Uh, there are some diseases, so West Nile uh, virus goes a little further and was certainly a big problem in, in the United States. Uh, but in terms of the numbers, absolutely tropical, tropical countries. Uh, the biggest uh, burden is in sub-Saharan Africa with malaria, but malaria is also in the Americas and Southeast Asia, and dengue is right across all those areas as well. Hmm. Catherine, let me follow up with you on this. Are all mosquitoes capable of transmitting diseases such as malaria and West Nile and the Zika virus? It's not, not all mosquitoes that can transmit uh, pathogens. Uh, certain species or certain uh, genera will be able to transmit certain parasites or viruses. So for example, uh, malaria is only transmitted by mosquitoes in the Anopheles genus. Um, the Zika that we're talking about a lot these days is transmitted by two, as far as we know right now, two species of mosquito. So not all mosquitoes um, are able um, to transmit all pathogens. Catherine, this may be a silly question, but I suspect that before three months ago, nobody had ever heard of the Zika virus. Had you? Um, I had not, no. Um, it was discovered um, in 1947, I believe, so it's not new to science, but it definitely is new, um, certainly to Americans, as in the Americas, um, and it really wasn't on a lot of people's radar as far as a public health uh, concern. It sure is now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Luke, what sort of techniques have been used over the years to try to uh, deal with the mosquitoes that you tell us kill half a million people a year? Oh, a whole range of things. Historically, you know, environmental change, so draining wetlands, that sort of thing. Um, more recently, the mainstays against malaria are bed nets, so nowadays insecticide impregnated bed nets, and also uh, indoor residual spraying, which is you know, spraying chemical insecticides on the inside of houses where the mosquito will, will rest after it uh, after it takes a blood meal or possibly on the way in. And, and those are pretty effective against uh, malaria, but bed nets are not effective against uh, the mosquito that transmits dengue and Zika because it bites primarily during the daytime. It also bites outdoors quite a lot more. So it does vary quite a bit from one mosquito to another. And the sort of things that are used to control uh, the nuisance biting mosquitoes, salt marsh mosquitoes and so on, are quite different again. So mosquitoes, as you said at the introduction, are 3,500 species, and they are by no means all the same in terms of their habits and similarly what you need to do to control them or at least the ones that transmit significant diseases uh, varies quite a bit from one to another. And what about the spraying of DDT? Has that worked? Uh, in, the, in the past that worked extremely well in terms of killing mosquitoes. Obviously it had significant side effects and also the mosquitoes started to become resistant to DDT. But uh, Aedes aegypti, this mosquito that transmits uh, dengue and Zika, 
it was eliminated from huge swathes, most of South America, uh, by the use of DDT. So it, it had some, some very positive features as well as, of course, some very negative ones. Katrin, let me follow up with you on the work of the United States Department of Agriculture, and in particular, a researcher by the name, and again, I had not heard of him before, Edward F. Knippling. Tell me about his work. Well, um, Dr. Knippling did um, a great thing by um, finding a environmentally friendly way or pesticide-free way of uh, controlling a particularly um, devastating pest of cattle, uh, the screwworm fly, the primary screwworm, um, that was causing millions and millions of dollars of, uh, to the cattle industry um, at the beginning of, well, for a long time, I guess. And um, what he did is he thought of a way to break the life cycle and he created what is called the uh, sterile insect technique. So pretty much what they did is they, um, they reared these screwworm flies and irradiated uh, with uh, very powerful x-rays uh, the pupae, so the sort of the cocoon of the fly before the fly becomes an adult, uh, so that they would create sterile males. And they would release these males um, so they could mate with the wild females. And essentially, those females would lay eggs that would never close into other flies, essentially breaking the, the life cycle. And we're using this technique, he was able to um, eradicate the screwworm fly from, um, well, from the southern United States, where it was causing a lot of problem, from uh, Curacao, from, um, and now pretty much the North America and Central America. Now, he did this, I gather, more than half a century ago, so I wonder whether or not this approach or this technique uh, still makes sense today. It does. It's used, it's still used today. In fact, it's used in BC um, to uh, fight the codling moth, which is a really serious pest of orchards. Um, it's been used against tsetse. It's used against uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly. So lots of pests um, of um, agriculture, uh, crops and livestock um, are being controlled um, using the sterile insect technique. It, it, is still happening today, and it's, it's been successful, and it still is. Luke, let's do a little compare and contrast then. If you take uh, the nippling example from more than half a century ago and compare it to the work that you're doing uh, in terms of efforts to genetically modify mosquitoes to deal with the Zika virus, how would you compare the two approaches? Oh, uh, what I have been doing builds on the work of, uh, of Ed Nippling. So, and that was the inspiration for it. So the method, as, as Katarine said, is, is a, a very effective against some particular species and also a very environmentally friendly species specific approach. But it has some limitations. We don't really know what makes a sexy male mosquito, but it's a pretty fair bet that a sterilizing dose of radiation doesn't help. Uh, and to put it in a more scientific way, the radiation that you need to hit the, uh, the sperm of the males to make them sterile also hits all the other cells of the, of the insect and, and causes similar sort of damage in all those cells, and, and that of course weakens them and make them, makes them less effective. So the idea was to sort of you know, reinvent with modern genetic methods uh, this, this method invented more than 50 years ago while keeping all the, the desirable attributes of species specificity and environmental um, benign nature of it. Katrin, are the mosquitoes that transmit the Zika virus native to the Americas? No, actually, they are not. Um, as you might uh, glean from the name, Aedes aegypti is actually native from Africa. Um, and the fact that it is on the American continent is, um, some will say, attributable to uh, slave trade early on, and definitely movement of uh, populations of humans. Um, would have uh, brought that species into the Americas. So while they've been here for a long time, they're not native from uh, the Americas and are considered an invasive species. Hmm. Now, Luke, of course, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but the, the assumption is you get rid of this thing and it's a good thing with no adverse consequences. But we do have to ask whether there might be unanticipated negative consequences that come with wiping out the Aedes aegypti. What do you think? Well, well, absolutely. And all of those sort of environmental risk assessments have to be done very carefully and on a case-by-case -case basis. So, and the answer may be different in different places. 
But in general, if you if you're going for an invasive pest, as Catherine said, Aedes aegypti is all through the Americas. Uh, you know, introduced relatively recently, and actually eliminated with DDT and reinvading only only a matter of tens of, of years ago. Then you know the, your starting position might be that eliminating it uh, is, if anything, by remedi remediation, getting rid of an alien invasive species rather than an ecological problem. But as I say, you would need to look you know carefully case by case to see if, for example, any native species has adapted to now depend on it, even though it never used to in the past. Could we there stop no more from? I'm sorry. Could we stop more from coming in? Is that possible to do? Uh, it, well, it, it's a very invasive species. It's very good at getting from one place to another, so it's been quite hard. Uh, now, if you were talking about a Caribbean island or something with a sort of natural border to it, yes, you might well be able to uh, eliminate it and then stop it coming back in, perhaps by doing sort of barrier control programs at ports and airports or whatever you thought the likely introduction routes were. But if you were you know, looking at one suburb of Rio de Janeiro and you cleared it of mosquitoes, they would come in pretty quickly from, from elsewhere. Sure. Now, let me follow up with this. Um, presuming a decision were made that they wanted to, the authorities wanted to use your genetic approach, if I can call it that, to tackling this problem, how quickly could it be implemented in Central and South America? Well, this is being taken forward by a company called Oxitec. And trials so far have been run on areas uh, covering tens of thousands of people and very successfully. But clearly to go from tens of thousands of people to uh, you know, several million, like a major tropical city, it, it is a big scale up, a sort of factor of 100 or more. And I think for almost any you know, production process, people would want to scale up in rather smaller steps than that. So go up you know, tenfold maybe or something like that at a time. But really... As Catherine said, the, the precedent for something like the screwworm program and the Mediterranean fruit fly programs is that these, these can be run on, on a very, very large scale. There is already a, a factory that can produce 2 billion sterile male medfly a week, so, huh. something like, uh, so tons a week of medfly, and they are rather bigger and heavier than mosquitoes. Uh, and the mosquitoes are very easy to rear, so the, or this species of mosquito. So there's no obvious limit to to the, the scale at which this could be done. What would it cost? Uh, well, it'll get cheaper when you do it on a larger scale, and the sm so the small trials so far are not that indicative. But it's really clear already that the, the control method can be done at a cost considerably less than the current burden of uh, dengue, never mind Zika, in terms of uh, damage and, and hospitalization costs and, and time off work and all these sort of health economics, things that health economics economicists add up. Sure. So, Kathleen, let me ask you this question. If Luke's genetically modified mosquitoes were, in fact, able to eradicate this one species in particular, do you think we ought to do a bigger project here and try and wipe out all mosquitoes altogether everywhere? Why? Um, <laughs> I, I really don't see why we would want to do that. Um, first of all, I would even narrow down the question to should we eliminate and eradicate all human biting mosquitoes? There are many mosquito species that really have no interest in biting people and I really don't see why we should invest a lot of resources into fighting them when they are not at war with us. Um, and then it's like Luke said, um, although it's possible to rear mosquitoes in large amounts and we can do this, it's, it's very resource heavy. And I think as a hum the human species, we have much bigger problems to tackle. And that's where we should put our resources, not in fighting mosquitoes, um, unless there's a serious public health concern like it is the case with Aedes aegypti. Um, so I think f to fight for human well-being, welfare, to fight disease and mortality, yeah, it's worth it. Just to be able to crush a little biting insect, I don't, first, I don't even think we could do it. Um, and I don't think it'd be very responsible to do it, even if we could. I don't know if this is knowable, but I'm going to ask anyway. Kathleen, do you know why apparently it's only female mosquitoes that bite people? Um, yes, it's only female mosquitoes that bite any um, any animal, and it's because they use the blood as a protein source to make their eggs. As the males do not make eggs, they don't need that extra protein source, and so they feed on nectar. Gotcha. Okay. Now, talk to us about the Summer Olympics. They're coming, of course, to Rio. 
there are, I presume, you know, much of the world is going to descend, or a lot of the athletic world is going to descend on Rio, which presumably presents a, you know, a major opportunity for the Zika virus to spread. How concerned should the Olympic movement be about that? Well, I guess the fact that the Olympics will be happening during the winter um, over there, should, you should see a reduction in the number of mosquitoes overall. Um, but then you're bringing in a lot of people. Uh, so when you talk about uh, transmitted uh, or insect transmitted pathogens, you have to take into account the three things. You need your vector, which is the mosquito species. Um, in this case, you have the host, which is the human, and you have the pathogens, that, that's the virus. When you have all three in one, in one place, that's where you can get um, transmission. Um, so there is a concern as long as people um, are aware and do their best to protect themselves against mosquito bites as much as possible. Um, that's one step. Um, and then trying to mitigate, um, just try to fight the presence of the mosquito in areas where, where a lot of people will be, um, whether it be high, high density of population. But the fact that it's going to be winter um, should actually help reduce the number of mosquitoes. Luke, can I get you to weigh in on the issue of whether the Zika virus presents a significant challenge for the Olympics? Well, Catherine's absolutely right that it's, you know, we call it the Summer Olympics, but it's their winter. So I suspect that as a health issue for the tourists, it won't be that severe because the transmission uh, rates will have gone down. But in terms of risks of disseminating the virus to other areas that don't currently have it, you know, in principle, you only need one. And, and I think that would be quite a considerable concern. There are very, very large areas that have mosquitoes that could transmit uh, Zika virus, but don't yet have Zika virus. And so the whole of Southeast Asia from, you know, India East, it's vast numbers of people that would you know, potentially be, uh, be at risk. They certainly have the mosquitoes that can transmit it. And do you have any inkling as to whether or not the Brazilian uh, authorities plan to release sterile male mosquitoes before the games begin? Of course, there are, I mean, there are ongoing releases in, uh, in relatively small areas. Uh, whether this will be scaled up to a larger in intervention uh, in time for the Olympics, I don't know. Gotcha. Uh, my thanks to both of you for coming on TVO tonight and helping us with this. Luke Alfie and Catherine Rochon, good of you to join us tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.